Hey everybody, Lawrence here with Dirty Basement Train coming at you with another one. Now a while ago I was on Etsy looking for some dried starseed pods. The same ones I use for the mouse for my worm monsters that I made a while ago. I'll put a link in the description to the video. But I came across something else. Birdhouse gourds. Now, they're called birdhouse gourds because in modern day we make birdhouses out of them. Little art projects and whatnot. Fun for kids to do. I made them as a kid. But I was like, I can use one of these in the craft. Yeah, I can definitely use one of these in the craft. So I ordered a couple. Now, honestly, they sat on my shelf for several months. In my collection of, my collection, not my hoarding, my collection of materials. Well, recently, obviously, I'm making a video for it, so recently, I pulled one of them off the shelves and was like, I want to make something with one of these. And it actually wound up being really fun. So, what I want to do is I want to show you how I went from this to this. Yeah, it's not my normal, not my normal wheelhouse, but sometimes you got to do different stuff just so you don't burn out on one single thing. It helps. It rejuvenates you for other projects. So, and also, this is why I keep doing challenge pieces. And this is a challenge piece, challenge piece for a challenge for natural using natural materials. So, there are natural materials in this. <laughs> the main building is a is a gourd. So, I want to show you how to go from this to this, or at least how I did it. Now, before we actually get to it, I want to give a big shout out to my patrons, Dungeon Matron. Your help's always appreciated, and my newest patron. And I'm going to butcher this name, and I apologize, Quarrel. Um, you guys' help is greatly appreciated. It really does help the channel. So, thank you very much. Okay, guys, let's get to it. This part's relatively simple. I'm just making a hole in the side here, basically where the door is going to be going. But what I want to do is get all the seeds and fibrous plant matter out from the inside of the gourd itself. Do you technically have to do this? No. But... I do have a little garden outside, so I want the seeds out, and I can grow my own next year. Also, it would be a lot easier to use like a Dremel or some kind of drill to open this up, but I do a lot of my crafting early, early in the morning before work, and someone else is sleeping, so power tools aren't really an option early in the morning, <laughs> lol. And here I'm just taking a you know one inch I think it's yeah one inch thick piece of foam marking out roughly how I want the top of the base to be because this piece does will need a base so I mean well it doesn't need a base but I want one for this so just gonna rough out the circle and then get the, like the biggest chunks off with the alpha knife. And this is just a matter of like blending in the angles and smoothing it out somewhat. Basically shaving it down so it looks more a smoother transition from the top to the bottom.
And here I'm just blobbing on a big old wad of hot glue to attach the gourd itself to the base. Pretty simple. And here I'm using this piece of foam that I'm eventually going to cut into the stair steps, getting the angle, carving the curve there for going up against the gourd itself. And now I'm actually marking out on the base itself where the steps are going to go, and I want to carve out a chunk that the steps themselves will actually sit down into the base itself. I could have cut the whole way through the base itself and then just kind of built the steps up, but for some reason I was like, mm, no, nah, I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> but it's just a matter of using some sharp blades and cutting away. And here I'm just cutting the scrap piece of foam that I'm using for the steps to size. I've had to double up on the pieces because the scrap piece was just a little bit too thin and doubling up gave me the thickness that I wanted. So, And I'm just cutting progressively shorter pieces because, well, they're steps. And I'm just now here I'm hot gluing the steps in. Okay? It's a pretty simple process. Just glue, place, glue, place, glue, place, glue, place. I mean, not that difficult. And being that I want uh, stone steps, using a good old foil ball to put in some texture into these steps. And here I'm just going to be mixing up a couple batches of sculpt mold. Two parts sculpt mold, one part water. And then spreading it all over the base just to give a more even ground texture. And, of course, I'm going to be, you know, having some of it spill over a little bit into the steps. And that's it. It's, using a sculptor mold will get you a texture that is just so easy to do. That I love using this stuff. And here I'm adding a ring of individual brick, or I'm actually adding two rings of individual bricks around the base of the gourd itself. I was in my mind, I was thinking, you know, this will look like it's keeping the gourd from tipping over, and it looks cool. So I was like, why not? I mean, it's just hot glue place, hot glue place, hot glue place, and here's the second ring. Again, this is purely for aesthetics, and it also kind of makes it look... It does make it look like it's keeping the gourd, the house from actually tipping over because of the round bottom. And here I'm using a piece of bamboo 
that eventually I'm going to use for the chimney for the house. I'm just basically cutting it. This honestly is a step you can skip if you want, but I do it because it allows... I'm placing texture paste onto the base itself. It allows me to like run some of the dirt up to just over the like small edge bottom edges of the bricks there and it fills in gaps small gaps that may probably won't be noticeable but i know it's there so i'm doing this and i'm gonna actually spread it all over the entire base where there's gonna be dirt i like the way it looks so i'm gonna do it And here I'm using a door template that I made out of chipboard to make sure that this off-cut piece of foam is big enough. And I'm just making slices. They're relatively thin, so you don't need thick pieces for your door. This will make sense in a little bit. But again, I'm going to use that same template and trace it out on a piece of chipboard. And get ready to cut it. This is a relatively simple process. I'm using it. I'm going to back my door with this chipboard just for some stability. And that slice I made works perfect. And here I'm just using some tacky glue. And just slathering it on. And then I'll attach that piece, piece of foam on and trim away at the excess. And here I'm using a stiff bristle brush to texture a wood pattern in and I'm grabbing my favorite expensive pencil tool to carve in lines for individual planks on the door. Pretty simple. And now I have this scrap piece of really thin foam that I'm going to do for the metal banding across the door. You want to make sure it actually that it's long enough that it will stretch completely across each plank because these are supposed to hold the planks of the door together. And now I just want to cut a little like point to one side. Not exactly sure why that was done like that, but it looks cool, so I'm going to do it. Pretty simple. And of course, now I'm using that same off-cut foam to carve a small, like, square piece for where the door handle will eventually go. Do a little cleanup quick, and let's get some glue on. Of course, I'm using tacky glue, Aileen's tacky glue for this. Just basically paint it on the back of the banding, and then put it where it belongs. Do that to the second piece. And then I'll also do that to the door, where the door, the little square piece for the door handle. Now I'd already carved out the door hole for where it's going to go. And right now I'm just, I have a glob of hot glue around all the edges and insert the door and get it adjusted to where I want it and hold it in place till it's done. Pretty simple. Again, it's early in the morning so no power tools. <laughs> I'm just drilling a small hole and then using my X-Acto blade to make the hole big enough for the chimney. And now I'm just going to be gluing the chimney in place, pressing it down to a depth that I like, and that's it. Chimney installed. 
And here I'm about to make shingles. Each slice that I make, I'm going to do this texturing to it because it'll save effort later. And then I'm going to make a big slice like this. And then I'll texture and slice, texture and slice. Now I'm setting up the procs on for, so I can cut all those slices down to half inch width, or not half inch, but quarter inch widths. This is just the si size I chose for shingles on this specific product or build. <laughs> But again, taking that whole pile and just making quarter inch widths. Now I'm going to take those quarter inch strips and cut them into half inch lengths. Because that's the size of the shingles I'm using. Quarter inch by half inch. And the best part is the shingles are already textured. When I was doing the big slices, I textured, sliced, textured, sliced. So I don't have to worry about texturing them at this point. Now I've got my shingles. I'm going to pencil on a guideline for my first row. You see a couple other lines there, but... I like yeah but now it's a pretty simple matter of just hot gluing them on you might be able to use a different type of glue but with the hot glue on this type of surface it's gonna hold so I wasn't completely sure if PVA would work on this gourd so I was like yeah I'm just gonna go with hot glue Unfortunately, due to the gourd itself, it's not holding heat very well, so the hot glue dry or cools off really fast. So you can only do small sections at a time. But all in all, that's not that big of a deal. Now here you see me using the tip of the glue gun to melt the foam itself to make it thinner. My thought was that successive layers would lay better, but I didn't continue this on after this because as thin as those shingles are that I made, it was kind of pointless, so you can just skip that part. But again, it's just hot glue. Make sure you have them offset from the previous row, but that's no big deal. It just aesthetically looks better, and you know you don't want a singular line going the whole way through. But again, hot glue, place on. Hot glue, place on. Hot glue, place on. Now I'm using this piece of timber that I had made from a previous project is basically a thin piece of XPS and I'm going to use that to hide the upper edge of the shingles because it looks kind of eh. and if I add this strip of timber around the top it'll actually look pretty good but to make that timber framing or whatever it was just a thin strip I think it's like a roughly a quarter inch wide and textured with a plastic with that same plastic brush I used earlier. Now it wasn't long enough to reach the whole way around, so I'm gonna use a shorter piece, another piece to basically complete the circle. And yes, there will be a seam or a gap, small gap line, but we'll take care of that towards the end of the project, no problem. So you'll never know it was there. And like for the lower section of shingles, I'm going to make a guideline for the first row. 
and for the top here. It's pretty simple, just a pencil, and it'll give you a rough idea of where you want your first row of shingles to go. And to put the shingles on, hot glue place, hot glue place, hot glue place. Now, for the chimney and the stem that's sticking out of the gourd, you will have to trim some of the shingles at like different angles and whatnot, just so they'll fit around, but it's actually pretty simple. And continue placing until you run out of room. I have a quarter inch thick piece of foam here and I'm using a one inch circle template I made. And these are going to be for windows. Basically I want to trim out the circle itself out of the foam. You don't have to be exact and precise, but... I have my circles here and I'm going to use this pencil to roughly shave out the frame itself for the window. I'm going for roughly a, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch and then I'm going to cut the inside of the window out. And now I have my frame for the window. Now I want to make this a uh, stone frame so I'm just using the pencil to carve in lines for the individual stones. And this is pretty simple. I mean you can see how. It, you're basically writing in lines with the pencil. And here I'm measuring out the interior of the window on my cutting mat. And now that I know how wide the inter or the diam inside diameter of the window is, I need to cut some grading. Of course, I'm using granny grading or cross stitch or I don't even know what it's really called, but granny grading. And I'm going to use for the grading in the windows. I'm going to try and figure out. So a lot of this is just test fitting and figuring it out on the fly because to give you precise measurements, I have no idea. And trim it, and I'm going to trim until it actually fits inside. But only trim a little bit. If you don't trim enough, you can always trim more. But once you trim it, to trim it, it's gone. And there's your window. And now this is a simple process of just hot gluing the windows to where I want them. I had drilled some holes because I wasn't still undecided whether or not I wanted to add lights on the inside, but I didn't. But I'm just adding the windows over the holes. Easy peasy. I've already primered this with a uh, black, and now I'm just adding a zenith or highlight through my airbrush. I always use my airbrush mainly because I just don't want to go out, tear, take everything outside. And this is just easier for me. And for a base coat for the gourd itself, I'm using a territorial beige from Apple Barrel. 
I'm using this smaller brush to get underneath the shingles and in between them and edging around the edges of everything, the windows, all the woodwork and stonework. And then, of course, those little mushrooms that I put on that I completely forgot. And then, of course, once I get all the trimming done, I switch to a bigger brush and just kind of go to town and get it all on. And for all the stone work, I'm using my go-to dark blue-gray for a base coat. Just slather it on anything that's going to be stone. Going for basically 100% coverage, if possible, with this. And here I'm using a light mocha for a mid-tone on the gourd itself. Just an overbrush, really. And with this brush, I didn't like... It, it was just leaving too many streaks, and it was getting on my nerves, so I switched over to a cheap makeup brush. That gave me much smoother coverage. <laughs> And here I'm going with a sand color and just giving a real quick light dry brush over all the area, all the gourd areas that are showing through. And here I'm just going through all the different, all the brickwork and picking out individual bricks and painting them a different color other than gray. I like doing this because it gives a little extra variety and it looks pretty. <laughs> it, it just changes up because of from a solid gray, which is just kind of blah to me, at least. I mean, if you like that, go for it. But me personally, I, I want a little variety in the bricks. And now I'm going to paint all the woodwork on the building a teal color. Thank you, Recon, for that suggestion because I was trying to figure out what color. I, I was going for a happier looking build with this. And I was trying to figure out what color to go for and Recon had suggested teal. So I was like, yeah, that'll work. So away we go. Now that all the individual colors on the stonework is dried, I'm giving it an overbrush with a pewter, a mid-tone pure gray. 
The windows, the bricks, the steps on front, anything that's stone. And here I'm giving all the timber work or woodwork, like the shingles and door and everything else, uh, overbrush with a apple barrel cool blue. And I said this is just a mid tone going over quick and light. And here I'm giving it a dry brush with a Folk Arts Calypso Sky. I didn't like the way it was looking, so I walked over to my paint rack and grabbed uh, Apple Barrel's Blue Cotton, which is a little bit lighter. Uh, of course, I grabbed an old bottle, which was, had a clog in it, but cleared out pretty quick. Like, yeah, this is the... Yeah, I like this better. So um, my highlight dry brush is going to be with Blue Cotton on all the woodwork. And here I'm going with my go-to highlight color for gray, granite gray. It's a light gray. I'm just going to give a quick dry brush over all the stonework, the brick, the windows, the steps. Pretty quick, pretty easy. And for anywhere there's dirt, I'm going to give a base coat color of Burnt Umber from Apple Barrel. Real quick. 100% coverage. And for all the dirt areas, again, I'm going to give an overbrush with some nutmeg brown. It's a decent mid-tone brown that I like to use from Apple Barrel. It's my go-to. We all have our go-to colors that we like to use, and I'm just as guilty of that. If I want dirt, I use my standard colors. And here I'm going with a dry brush of some territorial beige for the dirt. In all honesty, with the fact that I'm going to be going with near 100% coverage with flocking later, is this necessary? Not really, but it's the weirdo in me that makes me want to do it. And here I'm adding some black dots to some mushrooms that I added to the side, which I forgot to film. They're just the tips of some pine cone pieces that I glued onto the side. I painted terracotta, then harvest orange, then jack o' lantern. And now I'm just adding black dots. Again, I, I honestly just forgot to film this the addition of the mushrooms <laughs> or tree fungus on the side. Why did I do it? Ah, well, because it looks pretty. And it gave it a little bit of interest that wouldn't be there if I hadn't done it. And here I'm just going to be using an antique copper color for all the metal fixtures. You know, the door handle, the braces on the door, and the window grating.
And here I'm just placing some antique white dots inside of the black dots that are on the mushrooms. Just, just to give a little more visual interest or make it pop a little. And for the stem up top, I'm going to be using a grass green as a base coat, then I'll overbrush it with a Kelly green and do a quick highlight dry brush with a pale green. Pretty simple. And for the chimney, I'm just going to be using a uh, sequin black metallic. Just give it like that black steel kind of look. And now it's wash time. I'm using my homemade dark brown wash and I'm just going to give everything a wash just to seep in all the different textures of the tiles and just give it a bit of a grime look yeah you know, i'm going for happy colors with this but you know still got to be a little bit grimy <laughs> Now that I had everything washed, I wasn't entirely happy with all the streaks that were showing up on the gourd itself. So I grabbed one of those sponge brushes. Thank you, Dungeon Matron, for sending those to me. And I'm just going to try and smooth out some of the streaks and lighten up the grime on the gourd itself by lightly sponging it off. Now that the wash is dry, I'm going to go over everything that I want to do a highlight dry brush with. I'm um, using the granite gray to work on the stonework. Then I'll use the blue cut, light blue, blue cotton color on all the t timber, including the shingles. Though the gourd itself, I was actually really happy with how it looks, so I just left that alone. I didn't go back and do a highlight dry brush on it. I thought it looked good as is. And now I'm going to be using some watered down PVA glue and brushing it onto all the areas that have dirt. And I'm going to be sprinkling on some flocking. This is a pretty simple process. Brush on, and I like to sprinkle it on just so I can have a little more control of where it goes versus just dumping it on. And it's just how I like to do it. Honestly, this is, this is a custom mix I made of various colors and some fine turf and some couple other things to give a little various and variety in colors so it's not just a solid green. But again, this is just sprinkling on flocking, my preferred method of doing it.
And while the glue is still wet from the previous step, I'm using some yellow fine turf to sprinkle on in certain patches to give it light areas, like on top of mounds or whatnot. Just, just for some variety. And now I'm going to be using some earth tone fine flock and get in where shadows or corners and whatnot again for a little more variety of color and because it looks good or pretty Now that the glue is dry from the previous step, I want to lock this stuff in place, so I'm sprinkling on some isopropyl alcohol, and then I'm going to pour on some watered-down PVA. Doing the alcohol will break any and all surface tension that's on the flocking and allow the PVA glue to just soak on through, and this will lock it in place. Now it's time to add some bushes. I've already placed down a batch of tacky glue and I'm using some clump foliage to represent the bushes. Now I'm using two different colors just so it's not like one solid, one solid color of green. It's kind of blah to me. So again, this is visual interest and using multiple colors, it looks more natural, sort of, kind of, in a way. <laughs> But again, it's just putting down chunks of clump foliage in places that you like. Now I'm going to lock those bushes in place using the same method I did for the flocking on the base. Isopropyl and some watered down PVA. But I want these to be like flower bushes. So I, after I add the watered down PVA, I got some loose foliage from Huge Miniatures, uh, Dull Rose, that I'm going to sprinkle on the bushes to represent flowers. Pretty simple little thing. You don't have to be like super precise. Just I just sprinkle it on, and, and the effect winds up looking pretty good. At least I think so. And here I am just putting on some random grass tufts of various colors and places that I think it will look good. Don't overdo it, just enough to where it looks good. And here I'm going to be using some flower tufts from Huge Miniatures. I'm going to be using a magenta, a white, and black flowers. And I'm going to be placing them in various spots where, you know, it looks like they were planted there on purpose. And then some random places. This is to make it look pretty, honestly. It, just to make it look happy, kind of, I guess. But I just want them in various places that it'll look good. Look, And, of course, now I'm using some moss paste in various places where I think it look good. And to hide any mistakes or gaps or seams. And basically any place I think it should be there. And of course now I'm sprinkling over some yellow fine turf over the moss just, just to give it a little extra visual interest. Maybe a little bit of highlight. And here I'm just going to be applying a white primer to some skeleton bits. Because these are going to give a little bit of hint of evil that lies within the house. But I definitely don't want these to be the focus. Mm -hmm. 
And here I'm just giving those skeleton bits a wash with some Agrax Earth Shade. Pretty quick, pretty simple. Now I want all these skeleton bits to be in the back, have an arm hanging out the window, and then I'm going to kind of like push them into the bush that's in the back, underneath the back window. Kind of like they were just shoved out the window and left to drop into the bush. But again, I don't want them to be, I don't want them standing out, so I'm trying to kind of, except for that arm hanging out the window. This is only supposed to give a hint of the evil that lies within. And of course, I'm using some coagulated blood effect from Green Stuff World. Because I thought, well, so much for that hint of evil. I'm going to make it a little more obvious. Just have some bl blood drips and on the tiles under, or the bricks underneath the window. And have a little bit dripping down the wall. So it's a little more obvious than I originally wanted, but... I figured, why not? And now I'm going to use this dark brown homemade pigment powder. It basically to give some sh extra shadows and anywhere dirt might collect. Yeah, just to make it pop a little more in. This this is the effect that I like to do because, like I said, it does make it make, makes it pop a little more and just gives a lot more visual interest. And it's quick and simple. It's really easy to do. And now I'm finally going to add the door handle. I'm drilling a hole in the plate where the door handle is going to go. And I'm pulling out one of these little like post things I got in the jewelry making section at Walmart. Plus a little split ring, I think it is. I got to open up that little hole a little bit. Place the ring on and then close it back again. And now I have my door handle almost. I'm going to cut it a little short because I don't need that long ass post. Dip the end in some PVA 
wipe a little bit of it off, and then stick it in. And done. I have a door handle. And, of course, now I'm using spraying on some IPA isopropyl to lock in all the powder. And now for the pretty shots. I'm actually really happy with how this turned out. Definitely not my normal wheelhouse, but really happy with how this turned out. Hey everybody, if you made it this far, it means you watched it to the end, and as always, I do appreciate that. This one was fun for me. I thoroughly enjoyed building this little hut. Glorious house. Thingamabob. <laughs> Definitely not my normal bit style of build, and it was fun. I definitely encourage everyone to try something different from what they normally build. It... I said it may not be in your normal wheelhouse, but a change of pace every once in a while can definitely help, and it will keep you from burning out on the hobby. Uh, I, what else can I say about that? So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you like the house itself. And remember, everyone, when you're building your terrain, the only person you got to worry about is you, because it's your terrain.